Plutonium show, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I think this is 70. 70? Yes. Oh. Oh boy. 70 podcasts. Wow. Thank you all so much for sticking around if you've been here from the beginning. And if you're new, thank you so much for checking us out. And I hope you stick around for the next 70. Mm -hmm. So, it is the 1st of August when we're filming, filming this um, in Australia. We're a bit ahead of you guys, but that means that the hard copy book of Tom Barron's book, Revenge, hasn't been released here yet. And if you remember from last episode, I said that I don't want to read the ebook, so I'm still waiting. Good news is, as you all know, we paid for access to the extracts, which are still relevant because they're part of the book. And so another treat today, Zach's going to read through... I think it's the second last one. So this week should be the final week, assuming we make another bonus podcast to cover the extracts. If not, it will be next Monday. But by then, I would have had the book. And I probably would have finished it, despite the fact that I have assignments due next week. <laughs> Before we proceed, please allow us the chance to thank our patrons and our YouTube members who continue to sponsor this channel ever so generously. Thank you so much for all your support. And, oh, I do want to say, I have been watching a bunch of Tom Bauer interviews. Yeah. He is one of those people who is so just unbothered by journalists who come at him. And I've been taking lots of notes for the podcast after we finish the extracts because he just says a lot of um, interesting and insightful things when he's being interviewed by really hot-headed journalists who yeah. just go off at him and he just shows with his composure mm. and demeanor what a class act he is yeah so i'm very excited to cover his interviews and uh he seems to be it's the first time i'd ever seen him in person i had no idea who he was before the interviews and yeah he's just your regular you know kind of classy british man who is actually not anti megan because of course his opponents would have you believe he is he's not much like me actually he really wasn't bothered by her until the Oprah interview. Yep. That's what sparked everything for him. Yep. And you know what? Megan probably thought, after the Oprah interview, everything is going to change. Oh, hell yeah. It did. So, let's, uh, as usual, give a preview of the extract that we will be reading today. Or rather, that Zach's going to read and bless us with his uh, beautiful vocal cords again. Which is... You want to read the title? <laughs> Meghan felt she was the victim. Prince Harry went in to fight for her. A blow-by-blow -blow account charts how repeated clashes with the palace over family, charity and protocol led, inevitably, to Megxit. And I just remembered you forgot your headphones. You want to put them on? I will put them on. You don't have to reread it though, right? No. Should be fine. Alrighty, we'll scroll through and, uh, like I said, give a preview of the first paragraph which uh, you can start reading. At the end of July 2018, Harry and Meghan stayed for a week with Charles and Camilla at the Castle of May, the Queen Mother's former home in Cath... I don't know. Caithness? Caithness? I'm sure there's a way to pronounce that correctly. And by the way, it was Reitman's. Canadians corrected us. Reitman's. We said Reitman's. Tom Bauer says Reitman's as yeah, well. Yeah. But apologies, Reitman's. Yeah. I should know this actually, but... <laughs> The visit was used to brief the media that Charles had become attached to Meghan and admired her interest in history and furniture. Unspoken was Charles' bewilderment at the American. He had never really understood her or what she wanted. That week, his irritation about Thomas Markle's TV appearances, especially his criticism of the royal family, came to a head. Can't you just go and see him and make this stop? Charles berated Harry. Berated is in quotation marks mm. because it's hardly berating someone yeah i mean that's what we all think isn't it it's just like why don't you go and speak to your father who you clearly didn't have any problem with until you became a royal and that's the key point here yeah. because i believe we've said this before on the channel which is of course you can have bad parents because at the end of the day parents are human i think white culture has done well to move past this your parents are right no matter what mentality, but I yep. do know in other cultures, um, there is this emphasis of your parents are infallible. Yep. And no matter what they do, you have to, you know, I mean, yes, you have to respect them, but there is a limit, right? Yep. So it's important to note here that as you said, 
he, you know, she was singing his praises. Yep. Even Thanksgiving 2016, when she was already with Harry and he'd already released a statement, you know, of, oh, stop being racist towards my girlfriend. She posted a photo on her Instagram of her hand and her mom's hand and her dad's hand on Thanksgiving 2016, praising them both. Yep. So we have to remember here that Thomas Markle was in her good books mm -hmm. until she decided that she got Harry and she didn't want him anymore. Yep. Or need him anymore, rather. Because he mm. supported her financially. He got her. He opened the door for her yep. into Hollywood as an award-winning lighting director. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Thomas Markle, then Meghan Markle would have never met Harry. You know what? I think that's very fair to say. Absolutely. Yep. He was the cat catalyst in her Hollywood career because she never had a Hollywood career. Wait till I uh, rip into one of the journalists that attacked Thomas Bauer. Holy... He made himself look like such an idiot, that journalist. Mm. Clickbait journalists. It's like when you read an article and they go, could this unreasonable, unfathomable thing possibly happen? You read the article and it's like, no, but now you've looked at all of our ads, so we got the clicks. It wasn't clickbait. Yeah. He actually... It was an interview and he actually almost ripped a new one into Thomas mm. uh, Tom Bauer. I mean that he's doing it for, you know... Even, oh, like the ra ratings? He's doing it for the ratings. I don't know. Yeah, he seems so. really hot. Headed. We'll we'll play the clip if we can get away with yeah. it in a future podcast. But he seems really worked up about it. Yeah. But uh, anyways, we can carry on, I suppose. Carrying on. Charles could not understand Harry's explanations. Harry did not tell his father about Thomas's fury at being ignored by his daughter. Instead, Harry explained that Meghan refused to telephone Thomas Markle because she suspected that his phone was not in his possession and his email account was compromised. That sounds like ballooning. It sounds absolutely like something Megan would say. And like, who? how the hell would Megan have any information about whether his email is compromised? Most people don't know if their own email is compromised. I wonder if she was uh, hinting that Samantha, her half-sister, was controlling her father because that has been Megan's narrative, yeah. even in the email that leaked that she sent to Jason Kanoff. We covered that email when I made the couple of videos way earlier in the year covering the defamation complaint from Samantha. But in that email to Jason Kanoff, yeah, Megan was very clear that she thought Samantha was behind everything mm. and that she was the master puppeteer. Mm. So. Megan's excuses irritated Charles and perhaps also the queen. The monarch must have found it hard to believe that Megan could not resolve her differences with Thomas Markle. She joined Charles in a conference call with Megan and Harry. At the outset, Charles and his mother urged Meghan to fly to America for a reconciliation. When the Queen of England's telling you to make up with your father who's done no wrong by you, maybe you should listen, but the Meghan types never listen to anyone. Least of all the Queen. <laughs> yeah, well, because the only Queen in Meghan's book is herself. Absolutely, spot on. Meghan rejected the suggestion. It was completely unrealistic to think I could fly discreetly to Mexico, arrive unannounced at his doorstep, as I had no means of secure communication with my father, to a location and residence I had never visited or known, in a small border town, and somehow hope to speak privately to my father without causing a frenzy of media attention and intrusion that could bring more embarrassment to the royal family. <sighs> it's funny how the sentence, I don't know if Tom Bauer wrote it verbatim, but... Again, it sounds like Megan. It's the word vomit with no pause for a breath, punctuation, you know, like a full stop, a comma. It's just blah. I was not prepared for that sentence. The I'm surprised I made it through the first time. Well, the crazy thing is she absolutely has the ability, especially, well, I guess this was after the marriage, so she was already high profile, but she has the ability to arrive in places unannounced. No one knew about her and Harry's visit to the Queen earlier this year before they went to um, the Netherlands for the Invictus Games. It was a surprise visit. No one even photographed them there. I mean, there was a photo of a van that they suspect was Netflix, and then there was the SUV behind them. But point being, it was a surprise call to the Queen of England mm -hmm. rather than an unknown you know, reclusive, well, I say unknown in comparison to the Queen, Thomas Markle never sought the limelight. Yeah. Even as a lighting director, he wasn't a famous person. He wasn't a celebrity. Yeah. He was crew, not cast. It sounds like he wanted to put the production together, not be the production. Exactly. And in a, so she, she said it herself. In a small border town that essentially no one knows about, and the royal family of all people could have arranged for 
you know, transportation that was discreet. Yeah. And in a way where everything was hush hush and there were no paparazzi alerted. Of course, Megan would have wanted to alert them, but why would she? Mm. Whenever the paparazzi capture Megan, notice that it's always back grid mm -hmm. and it's always because it's, you know, dial a pap. It's like, yeah. hey, I'm going to be somewhere. So she absolutely could have done it. It was yeah. absolutely realistic. And she had his number. He has said multiple times in interviews, she has my number. It's never changed. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So excuses, excuses, excuses. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that last sentence, mm. uh, intrusion that could bring more embarrassment to the royal family. Uh, whoa, hey, you want to know what's bring the mo what's brought the most embarrassment to the royal family in anything coming to mind recently? Megan herself. Yep, absolutely. I mean, we're not just talking Oprah interview. We're talking that squat and that whole skit she did with um, Ellen DeGeneres. Um, that whole skit, remember? Yeah. Yeah, like, it was meow, so. Meow, meow. Yeah, yeah. She is, she is so out of it. She doesn't understand that her entire life is an embarrassment. Everything she does is an embarrassment. I mean, not embarrassment to the royal family. If aliens came to visit us, she would be an embarrassment to humanity. You know what? Um, speaking of the her father saying her, because you're going to read that in the next paragraph. If you want to read it, I'll just say something real quick after yeah. that. Her father's telephone number was unchanged. They could meet discreetly in Los Angeles. The queen was probably unaware that Meghan had never visited her father in Rosarito. Sounds like it, yeah. Um, Thomas Bauer actually spent two days with uh, Thomas Markle mm. in Mexico. Yeah. So everything we're getting here is, you know, if it sounds like it's coming from Thomas or information from Thomas, such as the telephone number was unchanged, Everything is directly from Thomas Markle. Yeah. He was very open and was found to be a very likable and honest man by Thomas Bauer. As everyone who's encountered Thomas Markle has said, as all accounts and witnesses have backed up that Thomas Markle, for all the media presence he has, everyone agrees that He's not a nasty person by any means. And I think most people can't understand how such a nasty, poor excuse for a human being could come from such a lovely man. Well, we'll talk about it when we discuss the interviews and what I've gleaned from Thomas Bauer in the next couple of podcasts. Because, you know, Thomas does own up to why Megan turned out this way. Or, yeah. or at least his part. Mm. You know, because I think people are born with a certain disposition yeah it's up to your environment to and it's not just what i think it's what psychologists say yeah the environment triggers it yeah. or or dictates how bad it's going to be because mm -hmm. you know with personality disorders again straight from psychologists i'm not playing armchair, armchair psychology it's it's also on a spectrum yeah. you can have a really bad malignant narcissist and you can have quite you know a harmless narcissist yeah so how bad it is is dictated by the environment i would say absolutely Absolutely. So continuing on, the conference call ended with both the senior royals perplexed. I was especially sensitive, Megan later admitted, to this as I had very recently married into the family and was eager to please them. Bullshit. <clears throat> In turn, Harry fretted that Megan needed protection. He sympathized with her resentment of the palace's keen sense of deference and hierarchy. I think it's... You can say deference. I thought it was deference. Okay, I think it could go both ways. They fundamentally don't understand, Megan complained during her visit to Castle May. They, included Camilla, who, with nothing in common with Megan, was apprehensive about Harry's future. I mean, aren't we all? Camilla saw right through her. I mean, we're going to come across this. So I'm not going to comment too much. But she was one of the people who basically saw right through her from the beginning. Mm. Camilla epitomized the best and probably some of the worst, characteristics of a practical, solid, English, upper-middle-class woman. Undereducated, expert as a horsewoman, a poor cook, keen to do good, with lots of old friends, she was grounded and not grand, as a no-nonsense, self-deprecating, plain speaker, with a good sense of humour who, when necessary, displayed a stiff upper lip, Camilla was most comfortable sloshing through the mud in a barber and gumboots. My understanding is barber, barber is a famous brand of coke? 
t- like an English yeah. weather coat, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. We might be pronouncing it wrong, but <laughs> I guess... Maybe it's barber. No, I feel it's like it would be barber. B-A-R-B-O-U-R. Yeah. The stark difference between the Cotswolds and California aroused Camilla's sense that Megan was an adventuress from Los Angeles. Unlike Charles, Camilla could see through the American actress's coquettish smiles and tactile performance. Camilla had occasionally spotted self-important adventuresses. They were the sort she might call a minx. She found it hard to believe that Megan would sacrifice her independence to serve silently as a team player. But Camilla remained tight-lipped. I'm very curious as to whether Camilla was one of the sources. I don't know if she agreed to speak to Tom when he was writing, because I believe he had over 80 sources. And yeah, it's uh, curious. Uh, I'm curious as to whether she was one of them. I do want to say before I forget, it's funny that she says she was very eager to please them when we already know, this is Megan, of course. I know this was a few paragraphs back, but we already know her antics leading up to the wedding. Yeah. How she bullied Charlotte, mm-hmm. which I haven't even read about in the book. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be even more mortified than I am just yeah. at the thought of it. How she was horrible to Kate. How she was horrible to the staff to the point where the queen had to tell her to control herself yeah. and to respect the staff. And then there is the tiara gate. You know, I don't know. I'm sure Thomas um, delves into that in the book because I don't know whether that's true or not. How she was throwing a hissy fit and she wanted the tiara, a specific tiara that Eugenie wanted and was reserved for Eugenie because yep. Eugenie was actually meant to get married before Meghan and mm, Harry. I remember that. Yeah, but because of hierarchy, she had to wait. And so all of these antics before she was even married, and then she has the audacity to say, I was eager to please. Yeah, no, it's uh, so full of it. So full of it. And in terms of Camilla, you can just tell just by looking at her that Mm. she is a no-nonsense, quite modest, you know, doesn't think highly of herself in the sense that she doesn't think she's a cut above the others. Yeah. Essentially, the opposite of Meghan Markle in every conceivable way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really, you know, I'm not surprised at all that she saw through her. To be honest, I think we've always said that women in particular have a keen sense when it comes to seeing through other women's bullshit. Yeah. Men, like Charles, can be blindsided by a beautiful smile or... You know, when a beautiful younger woman puts on an act like Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah. uh, Amber Heard. I mean, Johnny is quite a bit older than her as well. So, yeah, men can definitely be blinded by uh, minxes, as Camilla put it. Which brings us back to why this book is so important. It's not just about ending Meghan's career where it's where it is. What career? career? (laughs) Of a wife? Well, no, career of literally just being an all talk, no walk sort of person. Her career of public image, you know, she's a celebrity with nothing attached to her name. She, she is essentially a Kardashian. I was going to say, she's become a Kardashian, truly. Yeah. So it's important for, you know, people who I'm sure there are, hopefully there are a lot of men who would read this book and go, wow, I wasn't sure that women were capable of this. And by opening their eyes to this, Maybe the future Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's, you know, obviously there will be guys who just always go for younger women. I've seen it in the comments. I'll tell, I'll tell them when you're done saying your point. Yeah. But, you know, maybe some crises, some crises can be averted by exposing this sort of behavior. There are comments under videos about Amber Heard or even the trial where men go, I don't care what she does to me. Give me half an hour with that woman and she can end me if she wants. She can do whatever she wants. There are men like that. I don't know if they're trolling. Uh, I really don't because obviously you're not meant to take comments on YouTube seriously. The level of desperation though, because it's just, honestly, it's guys that aren't getting any. Oh yeah, it's those incel types. Absolutely. Because only they would be like, wow, end my life because I have no life because I'm still a virgin. Well, even under Taylor Shabiznis, um, for those of you who remember me mentioning that woman a couple of podcasts ago, very, very, very gruesome murder case. And some men on her Facebook, on Taylor's Facebook, because it's actually still there, open, and some posts are public, or like, I don't care. Let her do it to me. I wish a woman would do that to me. Because women won't do anything else to them. Well, if you know what she did, which I haven't even told Zach, because mm. it's that disturbing and I want, to, I want to spare you. Thank you. Basically, it's one of those things where if you want to know what Taylor Shaw Business did, please brace yourselves. Yeah. It's one of the... Because I didn't know. I went into it curiously. And I, in a way, regret it. 
I, like, I regret knowing the details at least. It's like what the word trigger warning was def was designed for, not, you know. I hate that word, so I'm not yeah. going to use it. But yeah, Ted Bundy in female form. Um, so for men to say, oh, I, I don't care as long as I get some and yeah. then she can do whatever. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I really, truly hope they're joking because <sighs> hope for humanity is... Flip it around. If a woman said, I, you know, if I could just spend some time with Ted Bundy, he could do anything he wants they to They do me. say that. We don't have to oh flip it around. Gosh. Ted Bundy has, up to this day, hordes of crazy young women who weren't even born. Like, we weren't born when he was doing his thing. But, I mean, he, he was um, ended as well by the system before we were born years. Yeah. But there are young girls who are younger than us right now who glamorize him and glorify him and... They have fan accounts and they have crushes on him and stuff, so. Back to the article. Megan was angry that palace officials refused to protect her image. She refused to accept that staff were not employed to promote her as an individual, but instead placed her in the grid of the royal family. Then what was the 2016 statement? Yes, I know it was Re Prince Harry's statement, but it was released officially through the palace. He didn't just post it, you know, it went through the palace. And they berated the public. Ladies and gentlemen, we've encountered one of the world's biggest narcissists. She literally joined the royal family because she thought the royal family was going to treat her like a queen and p push her as an individual. I can't, I can't quite, like, obviously I've always suspected that that's how she was. But for her to openly admit, how daft do you have to be? And she says, oh, they defended Kate. They always protected Kate. I mean, even though I was a child... The entire, I mean, the entirety of her relationship with William before they got married. And when they got engaged, I was still a kid. Even I knew, just from tabloids, which I never followed, you'd see them plastered in the yeah. supermarkets. Yeah. How vile the press was towards Kate. Yeah. She's white. She's an English rose. Beautiful, young, unmarried, innocent woman. And they still went after her. Absolutely. And you know what? Even if they did defend Kate and didn't defend Megan, Kate's worth it. But... That, no, that's besides the point. You know, they they never defended Kate. And mm. in fact, they defended Meghan. That scathing statement from Harry yep. was unprecedented. You know, it never happened before. William never even dreamed. So the audacity of this woman. Mm. Anywho. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still absorbing the fact that she, like... Yeah. You... All of our suspicions that she wanted to take the place of the queen are essentially being confirmed. I mean, even the queen wouldn't do that. You know, even the queen wouldn't go, the royal family is there to defend my public image because <laughs> the queen is not obsessed with her public image. Anyone that is obsessed with their public image, right? Like, okay, let's break this down. How you were seeing among your friends in your social circle, right? Now, friends, family, whatever. Of course, that's important to everyone. No one wants to be seen horribly. But the greater public image. One, if you're obsessed with your public image, then there's probably a problem with you. But two, if you're really that concerned about it, as say maybe a celebrity that's been through a scandal, go and do some good in the world. Go and help charities. Go and do things with, you know, poverty stricken countries, even neighborhoods, because where is the humanitarian because if she was being a humanitarian, she wouldn't have to worry about her public image because it would be well known that she's a humanitarian. But Exactly. I mean, Kate didn't even really have to try. So, I mean, no one had to defend Kate in order for the world to accept her and love her. Yeah. She married into the family and everyone just, she was just being herself yeah. in the world stage, on the world stage. And people loved her. Yep. Most people, of course, you know, no, not everyone's going to love you. And that's another thing these types have issues with. Yes. You know, the Amber Heards and the Megans. They have issues with accepting the fact, the fact, not the possibility, that not everyone's going to like you. You don't even have to be a famous person. Everyone in our normal lives where we have, you know, our social circle at work, people just sometimes just don't like you. Mm. There are some people I just don't like. I just get a Absolutely. vibe and I, I just really don't like you. I don't want to know you. Yep. And you just ships passing at night. You get on with your life. You move on. And the people that obsess over other people trying to get them to like them, yeah. it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. And least of all strangers. It's one thing with, you know, if, if the people in your life, you, it bothers you that they don't like you. But strangers on the internet, 
I mean, imagine if we went through every single negative comment, which I don't even read them. Ah, oh, there's you know, so little. The reason that I exist on YouTube is because I don't read the negativity. Because, of course, yeah. you know, it's horrible if you read those things and then you go looking for them. And that's exactly what Meghan and Harry did. I don't know if it's in this extract or the next one, the final mm -hmm. one. But they were obsessed with looking for negativity. Mm -hmm. Of course you were going to find it. Yeah, if you look <laughs> for the bad in something, you will find it. It's crazy. Simple such as that. People in such an elevated, prestigious position were on their phones digging for negativity. Man. It's, it's a sickness. Go and do something with your life. Because if you're stuck on your phone, you're not doing something with your life. It's, it's a sickness. It's a toxic yeah. mentality. Yeah. Anyway. Absolutely. So... <sighs> Megan seemed isolated, vulnerable, and stifled by convention. Apparently unwilling to accept that, unlike Hollywood, no one was counting the box office receipts or no one was counting the box office receipts of the crowds she attracted. She was waging a struggle for which she was not suited. Scornful of the palace's explanation that attacking the media would rebound on her, she adopted Hollywood's rule book and took the initiative. Oh, shit. I'm just going to scroll down for you because I don't have much to say yet. Well, I mean, every every sentence is like boiling my blood. Well, <laughs> but the fact that this is the expose, this is what's exposing her, I have to keep remembering, you know. The funny thing is, the interesting thing is that this paragraph would have you believe that she was Hollywood elite who was actually drawing box office numbers. Yeah. This woman's never been in a movie that was like a box office hit in nope. her entire life. She was an unknown cable TV supporting actress, like a supporting yeah. role. Yeah. And um, so it's funny because she's not even used to the box office counting the receipts mm -hmm. of the crowds she attracted because she never attracted any crowds. Yeah. Delusions of grandeur. She's stuck in this place in her head where she goes, well, I'm greater than thou. No, you're not. And here's the humbling. No other member of the royal family had suffered as much embarrassment from their own family as Meghan. There was some equivalence in Meghan's contempt for her half-siblings, Samantha and Thomas, and now Harry's for Kate and William in particular. The Cambridges, she believed, were failing to offer the recognition and generosity she deserved. She hated the comparisons with uncomplaining Kate. Effortlessly, the Cambridges appeared to be perfect. Meghan appeared to be influenced by envy of Kate. In turn, the future queen regarded her neighbor as dismissive. Ooh, this is like, it's got a lot, in, you know, in one paragraph. It's interesting. So there was her contempt for her half-siblings, which, you know, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. She is someone who clearly just hates her half-siblings and embar is embarrassed by them. But then it had to transfer over for, to Catherine and William. It mm -hmm. just had to. And... You know, by all accounts, these two are completely unproblematic, you know, live and let live types of people. Yeah. You know, the best type, really. And they are so quietly confident, quietly secure. It, it speaks volumes just looking at them with their children. Shows you what a healthy family they are. Like just yeah. full of secure atta attachment. Mm -hmm. Whereas these two are the epitome of insecure attachment. But point being is, I feel like she turned Harry on Catherine and William. Of you course. know, she went, it's us against the world, Harry. Yeah. Everyone's bad, including William and Catherine, yeah. who used to be your best friends. Yeah. Both of them. While playing the whole I am your mother reincarnated. Yes. Boom. And she hated the comparisons with uncomplaining Kate. Okay. It's not, it's never nice to be compared to someone else. But you know? complaining about it, it's like, uh, okay. Oh, I'm jealous of this person because they considered uncomplaining. So I'm going to complain about it. Yeah. The irony. I know it's, well, it's because she refused to accept, you know, she always saw it as no, but they're English. They have the stiff upper lip. I'm not like that. I'm an American. I speak my, you know, my, my what is it? I speak my mind. Yeah, you know, I'm nothing like Catherine, so stop comparing us. What minds? Did she just speaking gibberish? Because she hasn't got much up there. Well, I, I, I personally don't like the comparisons as well, just like on principle. But, you know, it's, it's one thing to not like being compared, but it's another thing to be jealous she and spends, envious. She spent so much time trying to mimic Diana that she didn't pay attention to any other member of the royal family before she met Harry. Because if you had just looked at the way that they carry themselves, anyone who w would possibly be afforded the opportunity to get into the royal family, 
if they were smart, they would study the members of the royal family. They would study public statements and public addresses and how they act. And how, it's like, it's like it's come in as a surprise to her because she didn't know who Kate was until she joined the royal family. Well, she projected, I think. Yep. I think whatever she saw of Kate in public, she assumed Kate, I'm sorry, I feel like I should be saying Catherine, was faking it. Had this uh, public persona, which to some degree, everyone doesn't act 100% themselves mm. on camera. You know, they say you, you what you add 20% on for yeah. the camera. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, to some extent, that's true. Catherine's not being 100% authentic Catherine on camera. But I would say at least 80% absolutely. is absolutely her. Absolutely. It's, you know. So, I think she was obsessed with studying Harry as well. Don't mm. forget, because that's how she targeted him. Yep. She studied him and perfected her strategy, and it paid off. Oof, except that you get books like this written about you. All righty. Kate, complained Megan, did not have to live with the latest irritating revelation, such as the Urban Dictionary's newly published definition of being Megan Markled. Ooh, I haven't heard of this. I told you about it. I probably forgot then. Uh, I told you about it yesterday. That Markle is a verb now. Well, it's been a verb for years. Oh, Markle. Yeah, sorry, the, Markle. The, the, sorry, the entire phrase being Megan Markled. No, it's, You're right. It's yep. shortened yep. to being Markled. Yeah. The definition, as the article goes on, a verb for ghosting or disposing of people once you have no use or benefit for them anymore without regard to genuine human relationship. Oh, man, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I remember you telling me about this. And uh, what's funny is she knows about it. She yeah. knows about everything. Of course, because she's so obsessed. What does she do when she's not putting on smiles for the camera and calling the paparazzi to come and find her at a, you know, I don't know, Costco's? She is reading about herself. She cannot if the conversation isn't about her she's not interested but how insecure must she be just purely from reading all this negativity even if you were once a secure person which she came across as a secure person when being before she met harry reading all this daily will do nothing for your mental health and your um sense of um security i no. suppose yeah i su i don't know like y y you all know what i'm trying to say just your your sense of being your sense of value so she's not doing herself any favors by looking for this crap. Let the internet say what they want yep. and live your privileged royal life. Yeah. <laughs> Furthermore, the fact that any sane human being, anyone who is right in the head, could not read every negative comment on the internet and come out the other side. You just want to shut down and never go outside ever again if, you've, if you were at this level and read every negative yeah. thing about you. But... It goes to show just how delusional she is in her head, how messed up she is, because she looks for it, internalizes it, says they're all wrong and they're all plebs and, you know, lesser than me and all this Jealous. sort of stuff. And then goes and does it again. Yeah. This obsession is just, man, it, it, it's still blowing my mind and we've been talking about it for so long. <laughs> Continuing. Seemingly stung by the criticism, Megan forgot an actress's cardinal rule, pose with humility, even if it is false. Despite being raised in Hollywood studios to work with others, Megan became increasingly fragile, demanding that the palace staff view the world from her perspective. In self-defense, she demanded retaliation against her critics. Gosh, you couldn't find a more unsuited person to join the royal family. It is yeah. like Harry went for the most unsuitable, ill-fitting personality mm. to add into the family. And I'm actually surprised that she lasted in the royal family for a year and a half. Yeah, I th here's the thing. I've said a lot about the lack of Megan's intelligence this whole time. You know, as much as some people think that, you know, I think yourself included, that some intelligence is required to get here. I think that, you know, manipulation versus actual using your brain for yeah. good are two different things. But I have to flip the cards here and go, I, an educated member of the royal family would have been able to see through this and would have listened to their peers. And, you know, because it is in a lot of ways, I'm sure British people would see this too. Uh, the royal family is a standard, for, you know, it is a, uh, an imp inspiration to look up to, right? And so that whole idea of, 
you know, listening to your siblings, listening to your in-laws, listening to you, all these people around you. Who care about you. Who care about you. And he's just like treating them as if they're just, you know, another average family, toxic family, you know? He thinks they're jealous. He says it on the Oprah interview. Oh, no one's jealous of him. In fact, he's the exactly the right person for Megan because all the torture he's going through, you, th- you would hope, it's not going to happen, but you would hope that he would come out the other side and be like, Damn, I made a mistake. I should own up to it. No. It's not going to happen. No. Oh. On Friday, October 12th, 2018, at Princess Eugenie's wedding reception, Meghan told everyone she was pregnant. Many wondered why Meghan chose to reveal her news on the bride's big day. Two days later, the Sussexes flew to Sydney. Well... What, what do you mean, many wondered? What? Because she has to be the center of attention. Everyone knows. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Come it's... rain or shine. That's how she and the types like her exist. It's their oxygen. They are entirely uncomfortable and feel like they're disappearing into thin air if they're not the center of attention. Look at the Body Language Guys videos where whenever Harry's talking or if her mom's talking, the look on her face, the anger, the rage, stop talking everyone needs to be looking at me you know what this is this is the the um what's the word i'm looking for uh this is the juxtaposition this is the oh come on i've missed it anyway it's a deep irony that the greatest thing that people like megan can do the greatest good they could do in the world is disappear because if we forgot about megan tomorrow the world would be a better place yeah if but that is just it. She is incapable of that because, what well, you know, the one thing that she needs to do is the one thing she refuses to do. Disappear. <laughs> Go away. Never come back. Never want to see your face again. From the outset, the reception for the Sussexes in Australia was ec- ecstatic. Large crowds cheered the couple, delighted by Meghan's special news. The Commonwealth, everyone agreed, would be enhanced by the birth of the royal family's first mixed-race child in the contemporary era. Harry and Meghan would be at the forefront of modernizing the monarchy. Gosh, it's so... I'm sorry, just really short commentary. It's so crazy how marrying someone is seen as a big deal. Having a baby is seen as a big deal. I don't know, maybe I'm not understanding because of, you know, the monarchy's history with racism and all that. Maybe it is a big deal. But I just feel like it's a couple who met and they had a kid. They just slept together and had a child, you know? It's so so blown out of proportion. It's like, yeah, whatever. There are people out there, anonymous people, unknown private individuals, achieving incredible feats. And this is what we're... You know, hailing as, wow, this is amazing. It's groundbreaking. Throughout those first days, the tour was perfect. Their visit on the second day to a family 500 miles east of Sydney, bringing a banana cake baked by Megan the previous night, aroused euphoria. In parallel, Harry scored another triumph. He opened the Invictus Games and scaled Sydney's Harper Bridge to replace an Australian flag with the flag of Invictus. The couple were loudly praised for arranging free flights from Britain for participants in the games and members of charities and warmly welcoming them at receptions. Their daily success, recorded by glowing photos, sent Australia's Republicans into retreat. The mood in the Sussex's Sydney headquarters was, by contrast, miserable. Although the couple had arrived with four staff, Meghan had decided that she needed to be surrounded by people she trusted. At her request, her friends Jessica and Ben Mulroney Mulroney had flown in from Canada to provide round-the-clock support. Mulroney doubled as Meghan's stylist as she worked through her show-stopping wardrobe. Oh, this is it. Yeah, we... Here we go. I referenced it. (laughs) Every night, Harry trolled social media, searching for snide comments on the internet. Every morning, he and Meghan turned on their phones to surf the internet. Thin-skinned, they were inflamed by the slightest criticism. Both bombarded their staff with demands for removal of the criticism. Harry, I don't know if anyone told you, but your royal monarchy, your family, it's not a dictatorship. And it's really unhealthy. 
It's extremely it, unhealthy. I'm surprised that a, you know, a 40-year-old and an almost 40-year-old even spend their time doing this. In fact, I find the older I get, the more I care less about what other people think. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. If there were teenagers, I'd absolutely get it. I yeah. would still think it's unhealthy and try to counsel a teenager not to do this. Yeah. But boy, and this only proves that they're a bunch of overgrown children. Absolutely. Over, so, oh, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> overgrown brats. Yep. Some people never grow up and regardless of what their body interprets and you know as we've said before there are 60 year olds who act like children uh, you know it's in insisting on removing the criticism it's part of the reason someone tried to shut down my channel what year was this 2018 yeah. wasn't this um hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think how this felt because remember around this time I'm not sure where it falls in but Trump was also you know uh saying ridiculous things and then there was that whole conversation about twitter removing things right yeah and that even though he eventually got banned that was an uphill battle a lot of people saying hey he's a representative people are going to take his word to the bank um for better or for worse and so he should be careful of what he was saying but they just like twitter refused because it was a public platform until the very end until it got too much so yeah harry really has no idea how the world works Amid the turmoil, Harry read that once again, the Markle family battle had resurfaced. The American media revealed that Thomas Markle had first heard via the internet of the prospective birth of a grandchild. Other scurrilous stories were dredged up. Harry blamed British newspapers for the reports from America. Oh my God. <laughs> but the only jibe he could attach to the accompanying British journalists was, was a report that one of Meghan's outfits cost... 19,960 pounds. One. Staff were blamed for not suppressing all those embarrassing media reports. Her mistake, she would lament, was believing them when they said I would be protected. She said this in the Oprah interview. Protected from what? The 20,000 pound outfit. Well, don't wear a 20,000 pound outfit. Everyone reports on how much outfits are when it comes to celebrities, if they can find out. If you believe you should be able to do whatever the hell you want without consequence, you need help. Well, not only that, if you think that it's embarrassing to, you know, be outed when you wear a 20,000 pound outfit, then don't wear it. If there's nothing wrong with it, why is it bothering you? Yeah, my outfit's 20,000 pounds. I'm a duchess. Why is it bothering you? It's just weird. It's because she knows that she, what she's doing is... Yep really not tasteful yeah and she expected a different response oh my gosh it's twenty thousand pounds oh wow she is so rich instead of damn who does she think she is yeah. harry inflamed emotions by repeatedly drawing comparisons between his wife and diana australia's huge welcome for the sussexes was comparable to diana's tour of australia with charles and baby william in 1983. the more harry drew parallels with his mother the more Meghan must have been convinced of her importance to the monarchy. I mean, let's not pretend he was drawing the parallels himself. She was feeding him, you know, she was brainwashing him this notion that she is Diana. As I've always said, it's all with people like this, they, they let out so much into the public that you kind of think you're getting it all, but there is this whole behind the scenes dynamic that we're not getting. And I promise you, all the nasty stuff we're hearing about Meghan now, it is nothing compared to what happens behind closed doors with Harry. Yeah. Harry, who was 12 when Diana died, perhaps could not fully understand his mother, her work, abilities, priorities, and historic significance. She was both a traditionalist and an iconoclast, a mischievous revolutionary and a selfless loyalist to the monarchy. Individual royals, Diana knew, must conform or the institution would lose its legitimacy. Her strength was the public's recognition of her vulnerability. Yeah. On this, I will say, most corporations want to have this approach of we are stronger together, right? It's less about the individuals. And in fact, I would say that Tesla with Elon Musk, Amazon with Jeff Bezos, when you start looking at Oh, Jeff Bezos is Amazon. Amazon is weakened for that mm -hmm. because then every fault of Jeff Bezos is a fault of Amazon. Yeah. Like they don't already have yeah. their own problems. Like there's no delineation there. There's no delineation. Yeah. You look the same way that Steve Jobs is Apple and then you hear about the horrible things that Steve Jobs did to get Apple and then that becomes Apple is horrible. Yeah, yeah. Rest in peace. The Sussexes had convinced themselves that their Australian success had blessed them 
with Diana's magic. What the hell? (laughs) Never having studied British history or politics or shown interest in biographies, Meghan also perhaps could not understand that Diana had won the public's affection after years of work. Neither she nor Harry could grasp that emulating Diana required time to weave a narrative and create a brand from which influence would flow. Unlike Meghan, Diana had never needed to seek money or fame. It's interesting because in one of her interviews, uh, Meghan's interviews, she would say that one of the quotes that she lives by is slow and steady wins the race. So because she often talks about how long it took her to get suits, you know, she was already 30, 31 when she landed the role and she had been a struggling auditioning actor for years and don't give it five minutes if you're not willing to give it five years. But it's so funny now how the hypocrisy of, you know, of Megan is revealing itself when you look at how she behaved in the monarchy and even prior to the monarchy, how last week we discussed she didn't want to be the face of Reitman. She wanted Ralph Lauren. And this is what I was thinking reading this paragraph. The complete contrast, Diana, someone who's willing to put in the work and who understood that things don't happen overnight. And then Megan, someone who wants everything now, 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 yeah. now, now. And if she doesn't get it now, she's going to be cross. Yeah. And she's going to be like, why don't I have this? I deserve this. The only thing she deserves is a padded cell. Well, that's the thing. And she just doesn't understand that it takes work. And now I'm really starting to understand why she never made it. Yep. In Hollywood. Absolutely. Because if you think that you deserve everything without putting it, while putting in nothing, then you deserve nothing. Yeah. Perhaps encouraged by Harry, Meghan appeared to conjure a fantasy that she could provide the leadership the monarchy required. <coughs> oh my goodness, the delusion. Stop trying to be the queen. We already oh, have a queen and it's never going to be you. Her activism would enhance the brand. To her staff, she gave the impression that she believed she personified the monarchy's importance. You stupid narcissist! I just can't. This is mental. This is malignant. This is actually malignant. If this is real, this is ill. This is... I want to... You know what I want to do for another frame? I want to get a picture of Megan in... And I want to put her face on a straight jacket in a padded cell. I want that framed (laughs) because I just... Again, padded cell. That's all I can think is lock her up complete like oh anyway naturally her american agents and lawyers were encouraging for years they had struggled to land parts for her now they believed she could earn millions from her activism because she married someone (laughs) shame of course she would need an american base and a foundation in which to deposit the proceeds her advisors neither understood that their strategy was incompatible with the monarchy nor did they care in their uncluttered scenario, Megan would earn millions and they would reap commission. Because her advisors were Hollywood agents, American agents and lawyers who are so far removed from monarchy and have no understanding whatsoever and will never understand in a million years what the monarchy is about. And I'm not professing to understand either, but I think we have more of an understanding of the selflessness and the unity, you know, the synergy that is required to exist within the monarchy. Hmm. Because... The monarchy is something greater than its individuals. That's what synergy is. Absolutely. And these types, her, her and her lawyers and her agents, of course, like attracts like. I'm assuming, you know, they're, they're on her payroll for a reason because they don't say no to her. Yeah. And so they're enabling this fantasy, this narcissistic, grandiose fantasy that she can overtake the monarchy and completely change an institution that has existed for thousands of years. Yeah. I mean, how many people would just be like, wow, I can't believe I married into the monarchy. I'm so happy to be here and I'm going to do my best to do my part and represent. No, she had to try and go above that. And oh my gosh, padded (laughs) so. On October 23, one week into the tour, the die was cast. Harry and Meghan seemed to have convinced themselves that William was jealous of their success in Australia. You mean the future Queen of England? (laughs) The time was right for change. They needed to break out of Kensington Palace's claustrophobic fishbowl. Harry proposed that the palace should rewrite the rule book. Rather than Meghan being a dutiful member of the supporting cast, she should star as a campaigner, independent of the Cambridges and even of the Queen. He enabled her. He enabled her. This is insane. I mean, rather than being someone who was in and is a prince of the blood and knows how these things work, 
a woman that he had barely known for a couple of years, even at this point, yeah. somehow managed to convince him that she could do things better. Learn the rules before you break them. Harry didn't know the rules of being a royal. Halloween costumes, enough said. Harry didn't understand anything that was required to be a royal, and they spent his entire life trying to teach him that there was a cause above his, whether you uh, for the royals or not. The point being that in that situation, it was not just about him. So how could he turn around and go, we're going to break the rules when he didn't know any of them to begin with? The crazy thing is, as someone who also served in the military, you really... Um you really, the way you're molded in the army, at least this was my experience, is that you are a team player. Harry was in the army for 10 years. How did it not sink in? How is it not second nature to him? You know, this notion of a team player. When we work together, the results will be better. Again, mm -hmm. synergy. Mm -hmm. That's what the army is all about. You will die mm -hmm. if you are not part of this team in the army it's life and death and that's why it's such an important part of training and they break down you know to a fault one could argue your sense of individuality yeah and it's you know you conform and it almost becomes like a hive mind yeah which yes you know when you remove us from that setting and put us in the civilian world that can be a little bit problematic and that's why a lot of veterans really struggle yeah. when they are let go because it's their identity yeah and they have to literally rediscover themselves. You know, when I transitioned from full-time, I went through that crisis. So it's really confusing to me how Harry very quickly went, it's, you know, it's my way or the highway and my wife's way or the highway. It only confirms that he was just a little toy this in the I, army. This is what I was going to say. I'm calling into question all of his military service now. And he was just a poster child. Yeah. That's all he was. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Anyone who served will tell you how... You somehow lose your sense of individuality. And yeah, it's all about the greater good. Absolutely. At Archie's christening in Windsor in July 2019, Megan banned the palace's accredited photographer and confirmed that his godparents' names would remain secret. In explanation, she would tell Oprah Winfrey, the same people who have been abusing me want me to serve my child on a silver platter. She doesn't get to talk about abuse. She was, you know, there is no evidence. Rather, I should say it that way. There is no evidence that she was ever abused by anyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, the tabloids have been nasty, but we've already spoken about this at length now. It's completely, well, it's, it's in direct correlation with her behavior. Yeah. She was the tabloid darling, everyone's darling, yep. a global darling, until she started to act out. Act yeah. out. Which is, you know, let's be honest, she never stopped acting out. And the irony of this sentence. The media characterized Meghan's demands as a poser's petulance. The tabloids she had hungrily sought until 2017 were now the enemy. Tabloids are always your enemy. They will always turn on you. No, not to her back in the day when she was hungry for fame. Yeah, but that's just it. They see people who are hungry for fame. They go, you're hungry for fame? Here, let's... Uh, what was that? You wanted to go home and have a private residence? No, nah, we're out the front. Ching, ching, ching. Um, just in the interest of time, because we are going over, uh, the next few paragraphs are talking about the charitable foundation that Meghan and Harry wanted to set up and how the palace apparently blindsided them by assigning four trustees to the, tr to the foundation that would have control over the charity's operations. And so under the law, the Sussexes would be denied any privacy over the foundation's management. And Megan didn't like that because she wanted everything to be kept hush hush. Yeah, which, which you know, when you're doing shady things, oops. that's how it is. Exactly, which is why um, all of their foundations and companies are set up in Delaware. Yeah. Because they want secrecy and privacy, which is hilarious because they advocate for the opposite. Yeah, kind of like the mafia. Yeah. So we're going to skip to Christmas of 2019 when things really started to go sour between the couple and the family. Two weeks later, the next stage of the Sussexes' departure from Britain was announced. They would not spend Christmas, after all, at Sandringham. They would stay at a mansion on Vancouver Island, guarded by six protection officers. Again, just uh, jumping in to uh, summarize, because I've read ahead, I've read these articles before, and um, uh, this is when we start talking about how she was back in contact with her manager, her business manager, and she renewed 
the uh, trademark for the TIG. We, I think we even mentioned this last week yep, with Frim yep. Fram. I remember that. And we started getting, you know, little tidbits of... Clearly, they're up to something. Yes. And many people, you know, predicted accurately, which is she is well, you know, her plan to move herself and Harry to the U.S. is well underway. Mm, I think it's just safe to assume that she's always up to something because people of this delusion are always, always trying to scheme. Yep. The Queen, after consulting Charles and William, took control. Convinced that Harry and Meghan would never resume normal life in Britain, the trio agreed that the monarchy's future should be focused on reinvigorating brand Cambridge. That was made easier by Charles and William becoming reconciled over the previous months. Without any formal announcement, the monarchy would be slimmed down. The irritants, especially Andrew and Harry, would be removed earlier than planned. Their agreement was conveyed by the Queen during her 2019 Christmas Day television broadcast. As Harry watched his grandmother from Vancouver, he was staggered. Four silver framed family photographs had been carefully placed behind her. It's actually in front of her, but okay. (laughs) They showed the Queen's father, George VI, Prince Philip, Charles and Camilla, and finally William and his family. To Harry's fury, there was no photograph of himself, Meghan and Archie. The Windsors were airbrushing the Sussexes from history. And I've, As uh, they should. I've put up the photo for you all. If you're not watching, just so you can have a look. I think it was a very powerful statement. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually wasn't aware of this because I'm not going to lie. I don't tune into the Queen's uh, Christmas broadcasts. But yeah, this is one heck of a strong message. It is. And it's just brilliant. It's These are the consequences of your actions, Harry. If you want to run around with your whatever... If you want to just follow her around like a a dog to a bay and let her cause chaos everywhere she goes, then you will be cut out. If that's what... I mean, he said it at first. He said they didn't want to be a part of the royal family. Okay, bye. What, you you want to have your cake and eat it too? Exactly. That's what they both want. That's what they're both all about. We've said it before. You don't want to work at a place, but you still want to get paid. No, that's not how it works. Last couple of paragraphs. We're almost done. Isolation on Vancouver Island increased the Sussex's sense of outrage. Listening to Harry's discussions with his family and officials in Britain, Meghan was furious that they were not accepted on their own terms. <sighs> the encouragement from her Los Angeles advisors was intoxicating. The Sussex brand, Meghan was assured, offered the same global opportunities as those reaped by the Obamas. They could exploit their royal status in films, books, finance, and the digital world exploit exploit i'm gonna go by endorsing a big consumer corporation the sussexes could earn tens of millions of dollars their first step should be a major interview oprah winfrey was waiting and that was the beginning of the end little did they know at the time but that interview there's an odd kind of well there's an irony a sweet irony to it where the interview that they thought would solidify or cement mm-hmm. their celebrity status, and as this article says, um, hail them, the next Obamas, is what ended up leading to their ultimate demise. And yes, you may say she has money and she has, you know, fancy clothes, but she's the world's most hated woman, or one of at least. Yeah. And their popularity is, an, is at an all time low. These people. I mean, the way I see it, have lost. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. what's the point? You know, we can already tell from this extract itself how they are vastly miserable human beings. Mm -hmm. Even when they were within the royal family, Mm -hmm. no matter how much love and clothes and money and adulation they had, what did they do in their private time? They were on their phones looking for negativity and getting enraged by it. So imagine what they're doing right now. When they lost all credibility, all royal status, they're a laughing stock. Mm-hmm. Imagine how miserable they must be right now. Is that really winning? No, it's not. It really isn't. And this, we always say this about celebrities. You can have all the money in the world and still be a very broken human being. She, for all the fame she has, is one of the most broken human beings on the planet. She was broken before she got into the royal family. And now that she thought that was her making it, she's... 10 times more broken. Yeah. And I really hope 
you know, in in an ideal world, none of this would have happened. But in an ideal world, this book would be the wake up call for her to her for her to go. I need to go away, but That's she's not right in the head. It's never going to happen because she is faultless in her yes. eyes. You know, I'm sure we all have people like this in our lives where you try to reason with them. You know, when it gets to a point where you just know that they're beyond any help. Yep. And then that's when you distance yourself. And unfortunately, the uh, in, the increase of people like that is just going up and up and up. I think it's just in correlation with overpopulation, really. I think so. <laughs> I think so. But also in having overpopulation, we can't take care of people as much, yeah. you know? So when you do have someone who ha maybe has tendencies like that, there's too many people to take care of. You're lucky to put people's food on the table and have clothes on their back when you're that and overpopulated. I just wonder if she fired her Los Angeles advisors who assured her that she would have the same global opportunities as those reaped by the Obamas. They've Ooh. produced nothing. Where's the podcast? I've said this before. Where's the podcast, Megan? That's, Summer has come and gone. That's the greatest snake wow. oil salesman I've ever seen. You will be like the Obamas, except the Obama... Uh. I just want to correct myself. I know we're still in summer because I know there'll be some smart asses out there going, what world do you live in? Well, it's winter here, by the way, yeah. in Australia, but it's August. It's over. It's where, where you guys are at the tail end of summer and she promised this podcast for summer. If Megan promises something, it's not going to happen. That's what we all said. Yep. We all said it. Thomas Markle said it as well. He's like, it's yep. not going to happen. Yep. These people, the Obamas have worked hard for where, you know, whether you like them or not, whether yep. you agree with uh, them or not, they were both very hardworking individuals who came from, you know, relatively nothing. They earned their keep. They 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 made their own name. Yeah. You know, they were both unknown lawyers, yep. just regular private citizens who worked their way up the ladder. Yeah, absolutely. Not um, slept their way up the ladder. Mm -hmm. You know, excuse me, but that's, uh, that's it's true. It's true. It's true because she has nothing. She has no talent whatsoever. And people with no talent who suddenly find themselves in positions like this, well. There's only one asset they've been using. Yeah. And that's it for this extract. Yeah. Uh, hope you all enjoyed the commentary and found it insightful. Looking forward to reading your own uh, commentary. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next one, will, the next podcast will be covering the final extract. And like I said, by then, I'm hoping I would have the book because it's meant to be out tomorrow um, in Australia. So fingers crossed I get the hard copy. If not, I'm definitely going to just place an order and because i'm done waiting <laughs> and um i don't anticipate we'll be covering it in depth i think it's going to be a lot of overview uh, rather than focusing as we have been doing with these extracts which is why we've been focusing on them because yeah. it's the only time we're going to be doing this yeah so uh yes thank you all for your support and uh do you want to say anything before we no, sign off i think we're pretty good there i think i've done enough talking <laughs> <laughs> thank you all thank you to our patrons and our youtube members for sponsoring as usual and we will catch you in the next one. Take care. <laughs>